All right, got your papers? We're going to dive in. Um, this week I spoke to doctors, uh, about 50 in retreat, doctors and PAs and nurses in uh, southwest Michigan. There's a Christian clinic up there that, uh, and they send, like a doctor will go out for four years and he, then he or she will come back for a year and work and somebody else will go. They've got this big rotation. It's pretty impressive. But they, uh, my assignment was to talk about burnout. They, uh, that's what they wanted to talk about. So uh, I said, well, okay. And I basically did what I'm doing with you, but shaped it a little different. So you, you get to, that's sort of where my mind is. So that's where I'm beginning. Moses is about to burn out, is, is about what's going to happen. And, uh, but let's, let's dive in. The burden, uh, the stress test. Um, as I was preparing today, I said, I wish I was talking tonight to 40 and 50 year olds. <laughs> I think we got a few in here, but uh, most of us are uh, beyond the years when some of us lived with stress. Um, I think back on parts of my life. Tim, you're probably, I don't know, you play a lot of golf. I don't know how much. Amen. Amen. Um, let's dive in. Okay, things aren't always what they seem. From the outside, the life of a leader may appear enviable. Big salary, corner office, in the spotlight, perks and privileges. I thought about, a, you know, if you got to ride on Air Force One, you know, I mean, what a great perk that would be uh, from the outside. But from the inside, leadership is a heavy burden and responsibility. This is especially true for leadership in ministry. Describe some of the things that make ministry leadership so heavy. I'll start the list, and then I'm going to let you complete some. This is how my list starts. Uh, caring for people's souls. I mean, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a pastor... If you're in ministry, you know, somebody may go to heaven or hell because of you. That's, it's not just their bodies. It's not just their minds. It's their soul. Number two, giving an account to God. He's going to ask, did you take care of my sheep? Number three, few resources. I've never known anybody in ministry who had enough resources. It just sort of goes with the territory. Whether it's money, whether it's people, whether it's facilities, talent. Uh, the devil sort of made me throw this one in. You have to be so nice all the time. <laughs> there were times as a pastor, you know, I just wanted to throw something or or say something, or call somebody a name, and then I said, I can't do that. If I was a boss, I think I could, but... <laughs> I do, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, yes. Uh, long hours. Your work is never done. Uh, this is just my own story, but when we moved to New York, I found I'd, I'd never been in so much snow and I found, I really like to shovel snow. And I asked myself, at least the first 45 minutes, you know, it was like that. <laughs> uh, but I asked myself, why do I like, why do I like this? Cause I, and I, then it, I, knew, I realized, because I know there's the sidewalk. I know when it's done. I have a feeling of job complete. And then it, I said, nothing in my pastoral world has that sense. Nothing. It's like... A sermon's over, and well, I could have done better, or I, I don't know. Just it's your work is never done. I think mothers understand that. Uh, number seven: so many interruptions. <laughs> you know, just in your busiest week, somebody would die, <laughs> literally, and had to have a funeral. It's like, don't do that to me. That really messes up my pastoring. You know, it's like. What are some other things that make ministry 
so heavy. Because we're going to look at Moses in a minute where Moses just hit the wall. Wow, good. Loneliness, though you're surrounded by people. And why are you lonely? What? Can you go a little further? I think that's accurate. Very good. For me, it was always, I wanted to be one of the boys in church. <laughs> but I knew I, there was a limit to just being a, their friend if I was going to be their pastor. That was, I always just was sort of out of sync. What, what else? Yes? Unrealistic expectations, Ooh. either of yourself and or from others. Excellent. Unrealistic expectations. What else? Anything else? Where was this? Oh. Grumble, people that grumble and complain. And that's bingo for Moses. Yeah, Moses his, had two million grumblers in his flock. Martha. Okay. And it's not your, they act on what you said. It is yeah. As, you know, that, that's, no, that's good. And a lot of this works for anybody that's been in leadership in any capacity, including parenting. I mean, that's leadership. But it's, uh, okay, let's keep going. Um, Window into the soul of a leader. The Bible gives a surprising amount of detail into the inner world of Moses. And probably in almost anyone's list of influential leaders in the history of the world, Moses would have to be certainly in the top ten and maybe in the top five. I mean, secular lists, I mean, this guy... The planet is different because of leaders, Moses' leadership. And interestingly, we get to look into his soul. And we might say, wow, it would be enviable to be someone like Moses. It's like, I, I don't think so. Uh, the Bible gives a surprising amount of detail into the inner world of Moses, one of the greatest leaders who ever lived. Those he led grumbled. There it is, Becky. Constantly about his leadership and blamed him for their hardships. Little wonder that Moses was often discouraged, frustrated, depressed, and angry. Here's just a, a few of the insights into his soul. When Moses saw the golden calf and the dancing, his anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Just And in Numbers 11, this is one of my favorite Moses quotes, uh, when two million people say, we're tired of this manna, we want meat to eat. <laughs> and Moses says, where am I to get meat? And I think he's just screaming it in frustration. I'm not able to carry, and then he says to God, I'm not able to carry all this people. The burden is too heavy for me. If you, God, will treat me like this, Kill me at once. <laughs> just, just take me home. This is so not fair. It's like a... the third bullet there. On numerous occasions, Moses falls face down before the Lord. I've counted at least three. There may be four where he gets, he's just pulling his hair out and he goes to the tent of meeting and he's just on his face before God. And I think, screaming, God, what am I supposed to do? And then the last bullet, Numbers 20. Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of the rock? Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. 
And of course, this was the moment where God said, because you didn't honor me as holy, you will not enter the land of promise. A warning to all ministry leaders. So I'm preaching to myself here, but maybe to somebody else. Moses' level of frustration in leadership eventually led him to sin in such a way that he was denied entrance into the promised land. Warning. Leaders who fail to find grace to handle the burden of ministry risk undermining their ministry effectiveness and finishing the race poorly. I think Moses finished... I, I, I think he finished poorly. I, he didn't get in. He, he did so well. I, I, I don't know what to do quite, quite with that. But that's a warning. It's a warning. Uh, let's talk a little about burnout. We're about to read scripture. Symptoms of burnout. Uh, burnout is a secular term. So you will, if you look in the concordance for the word burnout, you won't find it in the Bible. It's a secular term, and I've been thinking all day, you know, well, if the Bible doesn't talk about burnout, what does it talk about? And what is the right word to use for what Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist uh, were experiencing? Uh, we can talk about that. Burnout is a secular term dating only to the 1970s, used to describe a state of emotional exhaustion from mental stress. The classic symptoms include the following. Anger, irritability, quick temper. Uh, uh, yeah. Feelings of loneliness. David, there you go, loneliness. Depression, mood swings. That's Moses, just kill me. <laughs> I want to die. Four, fatigue, exhaustion, lack of enthusiasm, little motivation. You wake up tired. Do I have to go to work today? You heard about the guy whose alarm went off and on Sunday morning and he said to his wife, do I have to go to church? <laughs> She said, yes. She said, you're a father, you're an adult, and besides that, you're the pastor. <laughs> Quentin's laughing. I don't know, that's... Okay. Uh, difficult, five, difficulty making decisions. Inability to concentrate. Health issues, headaches, blood pressure, overeating, insomnia. Seven, cynicism and doubt. That's sort of where my weakness is. I get cynical. Just, I hope I keep it inside. Uh, number eight, wasting time in mindless pursuits. Video games, solitaire. Uh, that's a fun list. Um, let me keep going, though, because uh, we've got to get to the Scripture. I'm introducing it. Finding a cure. Secular approaches to dealing with burnout tend to rely on secular solutions. Things like, you need to exercise more. You need to watch your diet. You need to sleep more. You need to laugh. I love that one. You need to laugh more. You ever been told that? Take a vacation. You need to manage your time better. While such responses certainly have their value, the Bible doesn't come at this subject in those ways. And that intrigues me. Uh, the Bible sees burnout in spiritual terms and therefore proposes a solution that goes much deeper. And I'm just going to read through this and then we're going to get to the scripture because we could park here. But uh, in the book of Exodus particular, knowing God face to face and experiencing the rest that He alone can give. This was the key verse I used for the doctors this past weekend. My presence will go with you. And the Hebrew is literally my face will go with you. And I will give you rest. 
Moses. Number two, entering Canaan... Though there are battles to fight, cities to build, and crops to plant, it is described as a place of rest, just like we saw in the hymn we just sang. So you're going to go over there and fight and build and plant, but you're going to rest. That's what Canaan is. That's intriguing to me. Ultimately, Jesus is the only one who can give us rest, But this is no passive inactivity. There's work to do. But his yoke is what? And his burden is... It is a yoke. It is a yoke. But it's easy. And I'm intrigued by the fact that Jesus was a carpenter. And he probably had made yokes. And he probably studied the the contours of shoulders so that the yoke wouldn't chafe. That just intrigues me. And so when he said, my yoke is easy. It is a yoke. My burden is a burden, but it's light. And I just say, what does that mean? <laughs> it's like, follow me. Just follow me. Um, maybe that it's a two, a two yoke yoke or a two-headed yoke that he's in the harness with us that's a great question I don't know that's a great question number four in other words the cure for burnout is entire sanctification that's something that's fun to say in Wilmore and uh, and I really believe that is what the scripture is saying And it makes me pause and say, do I understand sanctification? And um, anyway, I'm going to keep reading, but I'm going to just sort of introduce these subjects. Last paragraph there. Finding the cure for burnout is just as essential to completing our journey as is learning the other lessons God has for us at University of the Desert. Remember, this is the fifth lesson. We had the bitter water test the no food test, the no water test, and last week was the Amalekite attack. So this is the fifth test. And this, you, if you don't learn this test of how to manage the stress in your life, you'll spend your whole life doing laps in the wilderness. Until we learn how to deal with overwork, fatigue, and stress, we will continue to do laps in the desert. Okay, let's, t- let's look at Exodus 18. And if you've, if you've got your Bibles, just to refresh yourself, from Exodus 15 to 19, I'm calling it University of the Desert, where we have these five tests. Bitter water, no food and manna, no water, strike the rock, Amalek- Amalekites attack, Go up on the mountain and pray. Joshua, go in the valley and fight. But this test is different. And there's no miracle involved. And it seems to relate to something as mundane as administration. (laughs) What an interesting word to throw in a very spiritual chapter. Administration? Um, I'm not going to read verses 1 to 12 of 18. But that is where Moses has a reunion with his wife and his two boys who are brought to him by his father-in-law. He apparently had sent them to live with her father during all the ten plagues because maybe what an easy kidnap that would have been for the Egyptians to take Moses' wife and children. I don't know, but they were off in Midian with, what was his wife's name? Do you remember? Zipporah, or Zipporah, Zipporah, and his two boys, Gershom and Eliezer. Wish you knew more, yeah. So they all meet, and his father-in-law, whose name is Jethro. He had another name that he sometimes is called by Ruel, 
R-E-U-E-L, I think, rule. But Jethro's better. Um, and in, uh, look at verse, verse 8. Moses told his father-in-law all that Yahweh had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And look at verse 11. Jethro says, Jethro, who is a pagan priest, and by pagan I just mean he's not a Jew, he's a, he's a Gentile, and he's a priest of some god, and Moses married his daughter. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Verse 11, Jethro apparently is converted. Now I know that the Lord, that Yahweh is greater than all gods. Um, I, on your sheet here, I gave you a quote. John Oswalt, on, on the last part of um, A, John Oswalt points out that Jethro is the first person in the history of the world who got converted because of somebody else's testimony. That's a pretty interesting observation. So Moses tells his father-in-law all that God had done. That's a testimony. Jethro is converted. Okay? All right. Verse 13. Let me read. Got your Bible? This is why we're here tonight. And you're going to see Moses is about to hit the wall. Verse 13. Chapter 18. The next day, Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand from morning till evening? What's the longest you've ever stood in a line waiting for some administrative matter? I mean, uh, my mind, if you've been overseas, uh, when we had to get our immigration papers in Paris, I mean, with three little kids in tow, and you'd wait, you'd get there at 8 in the morning and get to the guichet, the window, at 3 in the afternoon. I mean, it just was awful. Yeah, yeah, and then they would close, and they'd... Um, but waiting in line all day. Okay, where are we at? Verse 15, And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes of God and His laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly, what does your Bible say? Wear yourselves, Wear yourselves out. What else did I hear? Any other translations? Wear yourselves out. Wear yourself, you're going to be worn out. They're going to be worn out. For the thing is too heavy for you. You're not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice, I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make known to them the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Verse 21, Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, and hate a bribe. Pretty interesting list of qualifications. And not one of those qualifications has anything to do with training in litigation or training in law matters. They're all about character. Look for men who fear God, are trustworthy, and they hate bribes. And place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties and of tens. 
let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. Sort of like the Supreme Court. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure, and all this people will go to their place in peace. In other words, you won't burn out, and the people's needs will be met. And you'll make it to Canaan. You won't die in the wilderness. Okay? There's another paragraph, but it's really just repeating the same thing. All right. Can we draw some, make some points here? I'm at letter B on Roman numeral 2. After reading Exodus 18, what we just read, let's answer the following questions. What is the problem? And I just stated it this way. There's one pastor for two million people. <laughs> It's like, somebody should have thought of this sooner. It's a, but that is a problem. Uh, I mean, people have done studies on how many people one person can pastor. And it's a number, but usually around 200 or something is sort of, and then you've got to start adding staff, or, or the pastor's going to burn out, or the people are going to stop coming because, well, nobody here knows me, and I'm... It, you lose the ability to, to pastor at a certain point. To say that the church was understaffed <laughs> is a gross understatement. The organizational structure, what an unspiritual word to put in a Bible store, study. Structure, organizational structure, was making it impossible to move forward. But my point tonight is, this sounds like something, you know, you would put in bylaws and policy manuals and procedure manuals, and it is, but it is very important. And when it's working well, nobody ever thinks about it, but when it's broken, you just start doing laps in the wilderness, and everybody's frustrated, and the leaders are burning out. And you say, why? And sometimes it's a structural question. We have one pastor and two million sheep. And Jethro said you need groups of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. It's like, oh, wow. Thank you, Jethro. That's, that's helpful. Okay, so that's the problem. Um, what's the results of the problem? Uh, you, these are really right from the text. The results for Moses are he's tired all day long from sun up to sundown. He's listening to people. He's sitting down at least, but he's sun up, sun down. He's frustrated because I'm sure by the time he closed the window on his, the psychiatrist is in uh, store, you know, there were still 30 people standing outside. And he feels crushed by the load. This is just heavy. It never goes away. What else is Moses feeling? Any, any other words? He's, I'm sorry, Jim. That's very helpful. Yeah, you're so bogged down. He, Moses, you're supposed to be casting vision for where we're going and you're dealing with this neighbor dispute on where the boundary line is between their backyard and their backyard. Come on, we can get somebody else to handle that. That's good. What else? All right. He wants to quit. Yeah, he's going to. He's going to reach that point for sure. Yeah, this is not fun anymore. This is just work. Easy to become negative. Just gripe, gripe. These people, all they've got is problems. 
I can't imagine what Tim goes home with at night after listening to what he listens to in family court. You've given us snapshots, but I would, I don't think I would handle that well. He's, do you love your work? I think, I don't know, don't answer that. I'm putting you on the spot. Yes. Yeah. And I loved my work as a pastor, but there were days, yeah, the, the temptation to, yeah. Okay, what were the results for the people? The people were frustrated because their needs weren't met. And let me ask, is that a legitimate frustration? Yeah, these are, these are good people. They have needs, and they have Moses. <laughs> and my ticket says I'm number 419 today. You know, I, okay. But that's, that's the only option. And they're weary and they're tired. It's just this sort of dark cloud. What else are the people feeling? Well, they've lost the vision. Yes, good. Yeah, they've lost the vision. Where's Canaan? Where, we are, isn't this about milk and honey? And aren't we going somewhere? And all I'm doing is standing in line and... This is very good. And think how different this test is than, say, the no water test, where there was a miracle to solve it, or the Amalekite attack test, where Moses goes up and prays on the mountain. This test is administrative overload, overwork, time management, and there's no miracle to solve it. There's a pagan father-in-law who's got some really good counsel. I mean, this, I love the Bible. It's just, this is just such a great story. It's, and it's, it's he, good. He's no longer pagan. I, maybe not. I, I, I'm using the word pagan really non-Jew. He's Midianite. He's a priest. It, right. But maybe just a few days before. So, <laughs> Bingo. I accept that. That's very good. Yeah. Well, they don't have Sabbath yet. Uh, if my, if, well, maybe they do from manna. Yeah, they, yeah. But the chapter 20 is where they're told, remember the Sabbath. That's the Ten Commandments. But that's a very good point. They don't know the rhythms yet of work and rest. Work and, and neither, maybe Moses doesn't either. And what's at stake here? is never reaching your inheritance. I mean, this will keep you out of Canaan if you don't manage your time, manage your structures, just as much as thirst and the Amalekites will. <laughs> that's just, it's like, Lord, this is such a good book because that's so true. But it doesn't feel very spiritual to talk about policy manuals or somebody needs to rewrite the structure of the church because... Literally at Loudonville, the structure was killing us. We, when a church grows to a certain level, you've got to restructure it or it just won't work and your structure begins to work against you. And it's like, that feels so unspiritual to sit in a meeting and talk about structure, but it is vital. And we need somebody who's got the gift of leadership. Romans 12, verse 8, that's one of the gifts of the Spirit is leadership who can do it. And there are gifted people who can say, I know what the problem is. That's what Jethro did. Yes. Keep going. I just sort of don't like you anymore. It's just like I'm standing in line and my kids are crying and your dog is there and it's just we're waiting all day and we're hungry and I don't like you and I'm really upset at Moses and where's God? I'm just not happy. I think that's very good. And I, uh, okay, C. What is the solution? Now I, I just boil it down into two things. There may be other ways to say it, 
But number one, delegate. Delegate, delegate, delegate authority to qualified persons. Each word there is important. Don't just delegate authority. They've got to be to the right people. That's the killer. You know, you don't just ask for volunteers. Then the last state may be worse than the first. <laughs> I'm sorry. See, that's the cynic in me laughing. I don't know if you can tell that. but uh, Notice that competency relates primarily to character and not to gifts and talents. The qualifications of the people God told him to, Jethro told him to look for was those who fear God, are trustworthy, and hate a bribe. It's like, I thought this was about to judge the people and to decide cases. It's like, it is. But you don't have to go to law school. That's nice, but you do have to hate a bribe, and you do have to fear God, and you have to be trustworthy. It's like, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Law school comes next. I keep looking at Tim over here, and he's making snide faces at me. Um, this process involves selection, organization, training, holding accountable, etc., and break the congregation down into manageable groups, thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens. Sounds simple. Uh, I'm not sure it was, but it, it sure worked. It sure worked. So delegate authority to qualified persons. And two, this lets Moses concentrate on doing what he does best. And that is teaching the law, the Torah, casting vision, and when a case reaches the Supreme Court, then call in Moses. <laughs> Moses, we need your help on this one. But there's only going to be two on the docket this afternoon, not 863. For Moses to spend time on trivial disputes is a waste of time for the greatest lawgiver in human history. Now he can concentrate on teaching God's law. So what are the results of the solution? For Moses, he won't burn out, and he will be able to endure. He can go the distance. He will be able to do what he's called and gifted to do. Any other results for Moses? He'll be able to lead. Yeah. He can write. He can, yeah, he wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's a lot. That is a lot of writing, especially in 1400 B.C. And yes. What's wrong with sleeping eight hours a night? I don't know, you know, Ronald Reagan was such an incredible man in many ways, but, and I was, uh, I guess, in co no, I was older than college, but I remember at one point the press was trying to follow him and said, well, he, he just goes off to California and rides his horse, you know, he's, he's always on vacation in California with his horses, but it didn't mean he wasn't running the country. He was running the country, but he was resting. And he was an old man. I mean, he was a grandpa. You know, he needed, I don't know. But he, he I think, really knew how to rest and work. It, I'd never, I, I just remember I'd never seen that before. It's like, no, he's, he's riding horses. That's what he did. And he's not pretending to be working. He's saying, no, I want to be with my horses. Anything else for Moses? The results? That's excellent. He had time to fill his own tank. Yeah, who's going to shepherd the shepherd? Who's going to pour into the one who's pouring out? That's excellent. Time for his family. You see, these are excellent. And God cares about all these things. And we don't go the distance. Or if we do go the distance, we sort of get there with an eh, attitude. 
if we don't learn this Jethro principle. What about the results for the people? For my bullets, they will have their needs met. It says they went home in peace. And I'm, I didn't check it, but I'm sure the word is shalom. They experienced shalom. Ah, my needs are met. Somebody heard me, and they, they gave me justice, or they gave other leaders. And, and think of this one. Other leaders were able to exercise their gifts. Moses put me over 50 people. I'm over 50 people. I get to use my gifts of leadership for 50. I don't just watch Moses lead 2 million. I've got 50 people. I, that's, that's, that's exciting. And it is. What else for the people? Time. What's that? Time. Time. Yeah, I don't wait, spend all day waiting in line. More, it's just pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, say that again. A new sense of respect for Moses. And even leadership, just leadership in general. It's, it's working. Our policy manual actually helps us. I say that because our, with the FAS board, we're always working on our policy manual, and it feels so unspiritual. It just feels tedious. But I know how important it is. You've, you've, and job descriptions. I, I'm tempted to give. Anyway, anybody else? Are we ready? To, <laughs> Elizabeth's laughing at me. She, poor, poor Elizabeth, she has to put up with me. I know. <laughs> Don't respond to that. I a church that grew, and the pastor could no longer do the pastoral calling, so they appointed a pastor. Well, some of the old saints were very unhappy because the real Is everybody hearing this? This is, yeah, this is good. So, what does that say about the saints? Yeah. Um, but good illustration. And all of us pr have various stories like that, I think. And we've seen it. And when it's right, it's really good. When it's bad, it just, people get, people get upset. People join another church, circulate petitions. <laughs> You've been in that church too? Okay, let's do some summarizing. I'm just going to, lessons learned. I think, uh, and there's no order to this. And I came up with what, six or seven? Uh, this is really about gifts of the Spirit in New Testament terms. A body life. Church government. This is the fifth test at Desert U. Though this test is different, than the previous four, it is just as important. Failure of the stress test could potentially keep God's redeemed people doing laps in the wilderness forever. I can't say that strong enough. This will keep you out of Canaan if you can't manage your time. It's like, really? That's going to keep me out of Canaan? I, I think so. I think so. Okay, A. Overwork and burnout are serious issues. And I wrote that first because I tend to say they're not really that serious because they're not really spiritual. It's, it doesn't feel spiritual. Just as deadly as lack of water and food or being killed by the enemy, failing to manage time and resources can render us ineffective and unfruitful. So it's a serious matter, how we manage, how we administrate. B, it takes more than miracles to get us out of the desert. With bitter water, there was that tree. Throw the tree in and it'll turn it sweet. With 
no f bread, there was wonder bread. Open, every morning you'll have a miracle meal. With the Amalekite attack, go up on the mountain and pray. But this one, there's no miracle. God doesn't zap. Jethro comes <laughs> and gives some very astute administrative counsel. Susie, were you, who was saying? Jethro, yes. But it doesn't look like a miracle. Like, one of the commentaries I was reading today was saying, well, how did they do government in Egypt? How did, gov how did Pharaoh govern? How did he structure things? And I got a little lost in what the argument was, but it did raise the question, well, what, did, what models did Moses have? He had never done this before. I, um, when, this is personal. Um, when Loudonville was grow when I got there, there was, uh, I don't need to put numbers, but there was about 400 people on Sunday morning. And I was really the only pastor. But as we grew, you know, we kept adding staff. And I sat in a, every month, I would meet with other pastors. And Pastor Rex, <laughs> who was from Tennessee, it was like a Georgia boy and a Tennessee boy were pastoring churches up in Albany, New York. This was... And I really, Rex was a good guy. But he had the mega church in town. And Rex would stand on the pulpit and say, I do not go to the hospital. Yeah, he would say that from the pulpit and to 2,000 people, you know, in his church. I don't go to the hospital. And, but I said, Rex, you, you can't say that. <laughs> I said, I'm not, a, I'm, if I don't, I can't say that. And Rex would smile who was very savvy on this stuff, and he would say, well, you're limiting the growth of your church. I said, well, I don't know, but I'm not going to stand up and say I'm not going to visit you in the hospital. I just, I, that's, then that means I'm not their pastor, although my, I don't know. But it is, it affects growth it, and, and how we think. Whether that was right or wrong, I'm not sure. It can be debated, but it was just, how Stan deals with it. Susie, I don't know if that was related to what you were saying. Um, yeah, but here in Exodus 18, wise human counsel encourages structural reorganization and revision of job descriptions. <laughs> I mean, my eyes just glaze over when I hear structural reorganization and rewriting job descriptions. It's like, are you kidding? I thought this was church. It's like, this is important. And if you say why, it's because God says so. And if you've ever been in a place that didn't have job descriptions and healthy structures, it, it's, you realize life and death are at stake here. Administration is more important than you think. Remember that leadership is a gift of the Spirit. And if you've got somebody on your elder board or administrative board who's got the gift of administration, you've got a beautiful thing. If it's really a gift, if it's not a political tool, but if it's a gift, sanctified, given, it's, it's blessing. C, beware the Messiah complex, <laughs> which is what I think Moses had bless his heart maybe he had it innocently he said I've got to meet everybody's needs maybe that was maybe that's the complex I had you know who's going to meet him if I don't many people in ministry begin to assume that they are indispensable and that they alone know how to do the work perhaps they are over conscientious perhaps they're over anxious perhaps they're ambitious regardless of the motivation when one person tries to do it all it's not good D, sometimes pagans have wise counsel for those who follow Christ. 
I would love to circle chairs in a circle and say, tell me some pagan influences on your life that God has used for good. And I hope you've got some. It's what, uh, in the book of e uh, Exodus, Moses learned how to plunder the Egyptians. Look up those verses sometimes. When they left Egypt, God said, I want you to plunder the Egyptians. And what he meant was, take the good stuff from Egypt, and literally the gold and the silver, and build the tabernacle with it. It's like, Lord, that's Egyptian gold. <laughs> and God said, that's all right. Egyptian gold is still gold. Plunder the Egyptians. And some of the ch early church fathers, I don't know whether it was Chrysostom or some of these guys, but they would use this phrase, plunder the Egyptians. And they would say, th that's why we study Plato and Aristotle. We're plundering the Egyptians. And you, you can take this too far, but there are things Christians need to learn from non-Christians. We don't have a corner on all truth. Thank God for Jethro. And are we humble enough to learn from Jethro? Moses was. In fact, he was the most humble man on earth. Numbers 12. So learn how to plunder the Egyptians. E, in leadership, godly character is more important than competence. That's a big one. In 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, it gives us the qualifications for being an elder. And it gives 15 qualifications. 13 of the 15 relate to character. Be sober. The husband of one wife. Slow to anger. I forget what they are, but they're about character. Character, character. Only two relate to competence. Anybody know what the two are? Are you apt to teach? In other words, if you're going to be a pastor in the church, you've got to be able to at least read the Scriptures and, and help people know God so loved the world that He gave His Son. Apt to teach, and anybody remember the second one? You've got to manage your own family well. You've got to be a good father if you're going to be a good pastor. It's like, wow. That's the only competence you need to be a good pastor. All the other qualities are your heart, your character. That is amazing. When you interview pastors or associate pastors for a church, you know, we tend to ask, well, where'd you go to school? What are your gifts? What are you good at? We don't tend to ask, are you humble? How do, how do you treat your wife? You know, or how are your kids turning out? It's like, whoa, those are, that's scary stuff. You're darn right it is, and it ought to be. Um, yeah, even in Acts chapter 6, I threw that in. Uh, remember when they needed people to wait on tables? So they said, okay, let's choose deacons because the apostles are going to give themselves to the ministry of the word and to prayer. We're the important people. And the deacons are going to wait on tables, but their qualifications are they're full of the Spirit and wisdom. It's like, don't they have to be good at doing table stuff too? <laughs> it's like, you can learn table stuff. The thing about the, the abilities, they can nearly all be learned. But you can't learn char character. Either you have it or you don't have it. And F, equip the saints for ministry. Equip. We will never make it through the desert and into the promised land unless everyone discovers and uses his or her spiritual gifts. Everyone is needed. The primary job of leadership, and at least in churches, of pastoral leadership, is to ensure that the members are equipped for service. That's what a pastor is supposed to do, is equip the flock to do the ministry. Not for you to sit in a pew and watch me do the ministry. 
and pay me to do the ministry. No, I'm paid to equip you to do the ministry. Ephesians 4, And he gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood. In other words, to maturity for the church, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's pretty good stuff. It's a very different kind of Bible study because it's about policy manuals and management. And it's but I'm so glad it's in there. Comments, questions? Next week, we're going to get to Mount Sinai. And three things happen at Mount Sinai. There's a wedding. The law and the tabernacle is built. So we're going to spend at least three Tuesdays talking about when we camp at Sinai for about 18 months. And then the cloud's going to move, and it's an 11-day journey to Canaan from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. But that's where they say we ain't going. And they, then that's when they... Start doing laps. It's a good story. Father, thank you tonight for teaching us. And uh, I just want to thank you for how practical this material is tonight. It feels different. There's no miracle in it. It doesn't feel very spiritual to talk about administration. But, Lord, we recognize how we manage resources and time and how we equip the saints, Lord, everything hinges on those realities. So talk to us in those areas in our own lives where maybe some of us are near burnout or where we know someone who is. Would you enable some of these principles to help us be a blessing and encouragement to those around us? Dismiss us with your blessing. Keep us safe as we travel. In Jesus' name, amen.